Anemia can be a big problem and more common than most people realize. So today we're going to talk about the basics and explain them so you know what to look for. Hey, I'm Dr. Eckberg with Wellness for Life. And if you like to truly master health by understanding how the body really works, Make sure that you subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss anything. So everyone's heard of anemia, but it's not so clear. I remember even back in school, it took me a while before I really understand the wide implications it can have. And here's why. Because anemia has to do with blood and blood has to do with oxygen delivery. And why do we have oxygen delivery? Well, we breathe so that we can make energy and supply oxygens for all the cells in the body. And if you have anemia, that means you're breathing, you're taking in the oxygen, but you don't have a proper delivery system. Your delivery system is broken or weak or exhausted. So anemia is enormously important. If you have anemia, if your oxygen delivery capacity goes down by 30%, then every cell in your body gets 30% less fuel than it should. So you can see how far reaching that could be. So the signs and symptoms are things like fatigue, pallor, which means you pale skin, you look pale or whitish, uh, decreased concentration because you don't have the energy to think properly, Weakness, because you don't have the energy for muscle contraction. Dizziness, because you don't have the energy for the brain to proper signals properly. So, and the list could be endless pretty much because it can affect everything. How do we measure this? We're just going to talk about the very, very basics. So when you get the test, you know what to look for. And if your test doesn't include these, then you know to ask for them. Red blood cells. This is simply a count of how many red blood cells you have per milliliter of blood. And the number of blood, red blood cells in your body is enormous. As a matter of fact, 70% of all the cells in your body are red blood cells, somewhere between 20 to 30 trillion cells out of about 40 trillion are red blood cells. And if you look at it from the top, it looks like a circle, but if you look at it from the side, it's what's called a biconcave disc. It's uh, thinner in the middle, so it folds easy. Because these things are, because when these things get out into the very finest uh, blood vessels called capillaries, then sometimes it's so tight to get through that they have to fold themselves in order to make it through. So the shape is enormously important, and we're gonna talk about later how if that shape is abnormal, then they don't function and they get eliminated. The MCV stands, the V stands for volume. That's all you need to know. It's the size of the cell because a large cell can hold more hemoglobin. It can have a larger oxygen carrying capacity than a smaller cell. And oftentimes, if your body can't make the right size, if they're too small, then it compensates by making more of them, a larger number. So you have to compare these things a little bit. Hematocrit is the number multiplied by the volume. So the hematocrit is the total percentage of your blood volume that is red blood cells. If we pack them all together, then there should be about 40 to 45% of the blood should be cells by volume. And hemoglobin is the oxygen carrying compound. It's a protein that is part iron. It has a component of iron that can bind to oxygen and carry it out into the tissues. So obviously, if you have more hemoglobin, you have more oxygen carrying capacity. If you don't have enough hemoglobin, you can't carry that oxygen properly. So your oxygen carrying capacity, uh, what determines if you have anemia or not, depends on the total number, their size, and how much hemoglobin they have in them. So any one of these that is decreased could mean that you have anemia. So if we look at some of these numbers, then for a male, men have a little bit more of all these than, than women. Uh, so the normal range for men should be 4.1 to 5.6. And if you notice, that's a pretty large range. It's like almost a 30% difference 
from the upper to the lower number. So we really want to understand that there's a sweet spot here. And typically, you want, as a man, you want to be somewhere around 4.7, give or take a couple of tenths. But by the time you're down to 4.1, you're already borderline anemic. Same thing for women, the th range is 3.8 to 5.1, a little bit less, uh, but the sweet spot is about 4.3. The size is important also, and here normally we have a huge range from 80 to 98, but in functional medicine, where they look at optimum value, then they have narrowed it down pretty, pretty precisely that the ideal size is pretty close to 90, give or take a couple of points. So by the time it's down to 85, it's already too small, indicating that the body doesn't have enough iron to build these things properly. Hematocrit, again, is the total volume of cells and the range is 36 to 50. In men, the sweet spot somewhere around 45, give or take a couple. For women, the sweet spot is 40, give or take a couple. Hemoglobin, for men, it's 12.5 to 17. Again, that's a pretty large range. We want to be close to the middle of that range. And the sweet spot for men is about 14 and a half, and for women, is 14. So there's a lot of women out there who are in the 11.8 or 12 something range that have already lost about 20% of their hemoglobin, so they're borderline anemic, and yet on the blood tests, they're in the range, so nobody really gives them uh, any information on that. Nobody raises any flags on that. When people think anemia, the classic standard solution is iron. And it's not quite that simple, because even though an iron deficiency anemia means that all of these will be decreased, that in the absence of iron, uh, the body can't keep up with any of these four values, there are other values that we need to look at. When we look at iron in the blood work, then the first value we get, and the only value we get in most blood work, is the serum iron. That's how much free iron is floating around in the bloodstream, ready for the body to use for manufacture of red blood cells. But it's a pretty poor indicator of total iron stores because 60% of all the iron is bound up in the red blood cells. That's where the iron is doing its work. About 4% is sitting in muscles and the rest, serum and ferritin, is available for the body to make new red blood cells to utilize as raw material. But only 1% of that is in the serum and 30% is in the ferritin. So if you really want to look for if you need iron, you don't want to look just at the serum, you want to look at the ferritin. And then we want to understand that even though iron is important, there are many other factors that are maybe even more common in today's society, because very few people are deficient uh, in iron actually. They might be losing iron for various different reasons, uh, or not being able to utilize it, but a lot of people get enough iron. And more importantly, too much iron is extremely toxic. And we're seeing more and more people today with iron toxicities. So let's look at some of the other factors. Now, if, if it's not just iron, then what else do we have to look at? We'll just look at the steps that have to work in order for the body to produce red blood cells and to utilize iron. So the first is bone marrow. The bone marrow is the origin for the blood cells. So the bone marrow has to be healthy and there are a small number of genetic defects that where the, the bone marrow doesn't produce enough or the right kind of, of blood cells. Number two is the kidney. Very often in kidney disease, when the kidney stops functioning properly, it also stops producing the hormones that the body needs to make red blood cells. So there's a hormone called EPO or erythropoietin, which is the only place that the body makes this hormone that tells the rest of the body how much red blood cells to make. 
So when we don't have enough erythropoietin, sometimes because of a poor kidney function, now the body isn't making enough because it's not getting the message to make enough red blood cells. Third, diet. Obviously, if we want to make red blood cells, we need certain components. And the first one we talked about iron, but the next three are B12, B6, and folic acid. And these most often are deficient in vegetarian and vegan diets. So if you're a vegetarian or vegan, make sure that you supplement with enough of these vitamins so that you don't become anemic. Then once we eat the right stuff, we also need to be able to absorb it. And here is where there's an epidemic of digestive problems and absorption problems in our society. Stress interferes with the production of hydrochloric acid and enough quantity of hydrochloric acid is maybe the most common factor for absorption of iron and B12. Then there's something called intrinsic factor and if we don't have intrinsic factor, if it's not being produced enough or if we have an autoimmune disease, if we have an antibody blocking the intrinsic factor, we also can't use the B12. And if we have damaged villi, meaning the intestinal membrane in your small intestine primarily, this is where we absorb most of the nutrients. If we have a poor environment, if we have dysbiosis or something more severe, where the villi are being destroyed, such as in, in Crohn's or celiac disease, then the villi can't produce the proper enzymes and they can't perform the proper absorption. And again, we become deficient in these things, even if they're in the diet. And then we have to ask, so all of this, the first four is about making red blood cells, but what if we're losing them faster than we can make them? And so we have to ask if there is a bleeding problem. And of course, this is why women are much more commonly anemic because they bleed once a month through their menstrual period. Uh, some people lose a little bit, some people lose a lot. And if they're already marginal in their production, that loss every month can be very significant. Also, people with ulcers can lose significant amounts of blood continuously. And one factor in blood loss can also be aspirin because aspirin makes all of the digestive tract more leaky and permeable. So you lose an amount of blood through your digestive tract. It's like a small bleed every time that you take an aspirin. There is something called a hemolytic process. That means breaking down of red blood cells. So if in order for them to do their job, they have to be made properly. They have to be healthy. They have to have all the components and the nutrients in them uh, in order to live for three to four months and do their job. Anything that keeps them from getting healthy means they're not going to live out their full three to four months and they're going to be breaking or being destroyed too soon. So drugs can coat the red blood cells and make them look like they're defective. And then the spleen's job is to filter out. So the spleen is like an oil filter. It takes out the crud and the, the defective red blood cells and the cell debris from the bloodstream. And if something doesn't look like it's supposed to, it's the spleen's job to get rid of it. Uh, so drugs can make the red blood cells look abnormal. Toxins can do it. Toxins can also break the red blood cells or keep them from forming properly. And then there is the genetic component where there are people with sickle cell anemia or spherocytosis, meaning the red blood cell doesn't have this perfect round or biconcave shape. And now the spleen recognizes it as abnormal and it gets filtered out and destroyed. All of these things have to work in order for us to make blood properly, to make red blood cells the way they're supposed to be. And iron, like we said, can be a common problem, but there's way more to this than simply starting to throw in some iron in the body. If you're eating a normal average diet with a fair amount of, of meat 
and you are anemic, then there's more likely that there's something else here that's not working that we have to address first. And then we have to find you the right form of iron that is highly absorbable and that your body can utilize in the proper way. Just like everything else that we talk about on this channel and in our office, we never look at one little thing by itself. We always look at the big picture. We have to ask, what is the root cause? Why is this happening? And then we handle that root cause. And then once we got that underway, then we do everything else that we know to get healthy. Because every one of these steps that don't work means that there's some lack of health. And the best thing that we can do to make sure that this works in the long run is to do everything we can to take care of ourselves. So in our office, we talk about the chemical, structural, and emotional stress that we need to address the whole person holistically, and we have to do it in a way that we support it in the long run. Not the quick fixes, not the little pinpoint actions or treatments. We look at the big picture, we handle the cause, and then we work on a long-term lifestyle. So I hope you enjoyed this information. Let me know if there's any more questions that you have or if you have any experience with any of what I've been talking about. Please share this information because the more people that know about this, the more we can build a healthy population and we can have a whole bunch of healthy people uh, and happy people around us. And as always, thanks so much for watching.